O oh Lord, I submit my humble entreaty or appeal to you, to your lotus feet. I do not pray for physical pleasures, knowledge, wealth, or followers. I seek neither heaven, if everybody can leave their phones and internet connections to be distracting as, as the speaker. I seek neither heaven nor salvation, nor do I pray for any kind of opulence. Whatever birth, you notice he's not asking for freedom from suffering either. I'm not asking for heaven, I'm not asking for physical pleasures, I'm not asking for profit, adoration, distinction, and he's not asking for freedom from all this in terms of liberation. I seek neither heaven nor salvation, nor any kind of opulence. We'll find out why as this fourth chapter develops with all these magnificent verses that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur chose. So I'm not asking for liberation. I may take my birth. Why? I deserve to take so many births due to my sinful and offensive karma. But whatever birth I attain by my merits and faults of my karma, and this isn't even Karma isn't even necessarily intentional, and still I have to get the results. For example, if I turn on a water tap just to wash my hands, there are so many bacteria in that tap that are being killed, so many microscopic insects that are being killed or as I walk on the grass, or even as I breathe the air. And I have to suffer those sinful reactions unless I'm doing that for Krishna. I may think that I'm doing something for Krishna, but I may be doing it for myself. As we can see in studying these various levels of bhakti, the gradual development of doing something for Krishna and Guru and not myself comes stage by stage. Really, in the next stage that we'll be discussing, which is Asakti, the fifth stage of Bhakti and the next chapter, the fifth chapter of Sri Bhajan Rahasya, at that time Bhakti enters the heart. And my heart has a semblance of melting. I become attached both to bhajan and bhajaniya, the object of bhajan. And guess what? Krishna's heart also starts melting for my prayers. Gurudev explains in his commentary in the next chapter that until we come to the stage of asakti, or natural attachment, like a boy is naturally attached to a girl, and vice versa. Until we come to that stage, Krishna personally does not hear our prayers. The super soul hears our prayers. And in asakti, Krishna not only hears our prayers, but his heart begins to melt out of compassion to fulfill those prayers. That's why in the song Sharanagati, it's stated that the son of Nanda Maharaj only hears the prayers of those who are following these six limbs of Sharanagati, which, although Sharanagati is described not as a limb of bhakti, but as the doorway to bhakti, Actually, in the 64 limbs of bhakti described in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, and also in our Srila Prabhupada's summary study, Nectar of Devotion, 
these six symptoms of Sharanagati are six of the limbs of bhakti. And they develop increasing reality of surrender as we increase uh, in the various stages. So the surrender is so intense in the next stage coming up, which is prepared in this stage of ruchi or taste, which is which correlates with this verse, Nadanam Nadanam Nasundaring. I don't want any wealth, I don't want any followers, I don't want heaven, I don't want salvation. I only want your causeless devotion in my life, birth after birth. So these previous stages prepare us, ready us for that stage of asakti coming soon, which is the semblance, the semblance of my siddhadeha, spiritual form manifests, a semblance of my having absolutely no material desires other than the desire to please Krishna, like the gopis. So when my desire to turn on a tap, or to walk on the grass, or to breathe is only for the satisfaction of Krishna, at that time I have no sinful reactions. Otherwise I'm suffering the reactions of my sins and offenses that I'm not even aware that I'm committing, that I commit unknowingly. Once uh, in San Francisco, one of the Gurudev's disciples asked him about cutting grass, you know, with the lawnmower, cutting grass, because she said, I want to make things nice for when the Vaishnavas come over. Vaishnavas means the neophyte Vaishnavas. All of us come over for our program. So Gurudev said, if you're really doing it to satisfy the Lord and his pure devotees, then there'll be no reaction. Otherwise, there'll be a reaction. Okay. My only hope is that a hoitiki bhakti, a hoitiki means causeless, without any cause, without any motive, other than to please Krishna. My only hope is that that kind of devotion for your Lord's feet enters my heart. How often? At every moment. Whatever attraction I now have for worldly pleasures, may I develop such attraction for your feet. Srila Gurudev emphasizes this verse. Sometimes he would call on different devotees to <coughs> explain, to translate this verse of Srila Bhakti Thakur's song. Whatever attachment I have now for material pleasures, may that same or more spontaneous attachment and grief for your service come in my heart. In adversity or opulence, prosperity, may that attraction be steady. We'll see in these of verses chosen by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur that when the devotee becomes a real sadhak, beginning at this stage, then he doesn't see the difference between loss and gain. Mukunda never appears in the heart of someone who laments over loss and rejoices over material gain. So the real sadhak, that is someone who's practicing his bhakti uh, activities for the sole purpose of attaining bhava bhakti, or spiritual sentiments of the soul. He sees both loss and prosperity as equal mercy of Krishna given in order to increase his eagerness for service. 
And in the next stage coming up soon, the stage of asakti, the greed for service of Srimati Radhika manifests in the heart. And there's so many wonderful verses which we'll be discussing. Then, be I a bird or a beast in heaven or in hell, may bhakti to you remain perpetually within the heart of this bhakti vinod. What happens when we say these prayers? Do we really mean them? Is that all I want? Or do I just want to rest? Do I just want to lie down? Do I just want some praise? Do I just want something nice to eat? So why am I uttering these prayers? Srila Gurudev explains that it creates impressions. Just like if you have, again, let's use the tap example, but for a different purpose. If you have a tap that you've tried to turn off, but it's dripping, drip, drip, drip. Nothing happens on the cement ground, but gradually, after so many drips, day after day, week after week, this, even the cement ground begins to get a hole in it. So did that hole come from the last drip, or did it come from the first drip? Gradually, impressions were being made. And those impressions are called sun scars. And those sun scars, impressions on the heart, gradually change our identity. As we'll see in the next, here I'm praying for causeless devotional service in this fourth chapter. And in the fifth chapter, I am, O son of Nanda, I am your eternal servant. But although I am so, I have fallen into this ocean of birth and death. Please pick me up and engage me in your service. So let's see what verses. Yes. Would you like me to hand out the prayer sheet? Oh, thank you. I forgot all about that. For those who didn't get the prayer, for those who lost their prayers, we'll be saying that as we now begin the class. So, and who didn't get the... Um, uh, the Wheel of Fortune. Okay. Um, thank you. Sham kindly zero us all these things. So now we'll utter the prayers together. Oh. Can I one copy down there? Oh, the wheel. What? Okay. I think he did it Does everybody have prayers? And does everybody have wheels? Wheels of fortune. Okay, let's begin the prayer together. Ajnanam timiram dasya Jnanam jatakalakaya Jakshodam pitam yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Gurave
First, I offer my unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipful Diksha Gurudev. Nichalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Astota Dasat Shri Shima Chula Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. And the same unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipful Shikshi Gurudev. Nichalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Astota Dasat Shri Shima Shula Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Shula Bhakti Vigyan Bharati Goswami Maharaj. To all of our Guru Varga and all the assembled devotees. So, having just mentioned Shula Bharati Maharaj, now you all know him. You go to his classes at night. During the month of Kartik, in his temple in Chandigarh, because Chandigarh is not Vrindavan, so to speak, except, of course, when the pure devotee is there. The way they observe Rajmandal Parikrama is by practicing this book, Sri Bhajan Rahasya. As you know, there are eight chapters which correspond to the eight times of day of Radha and Krishna's 24-hour day daily pastimes which corresponds to the eight pairs of the holy names, which correspond to the um, seven sections of the first verse of Shikshastakam, which corresponds to the eight stages of Bhakti, beginning from Ado, Shraddha, all the way to Prem. So what they do there is every day during the different times of the day that corresponds with the Lord's pastimes, they sing these various songs of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Shikshastakam songs. So before Mangalarati, they'll sing a couple and then read that time of Nishantalila of Radha and Krishna. Then after Mangalarti, Srila Bharati Maharaj comes and sings with them and then reads uh, Radha and Krishna's pastime, speaks a few words about that particular verse of Shikshastakam. Then later in the day, around 9 in the morning, they sing another verse and read another part of Radha and Krishna's pastimes. Then again, uh, mid-afternoon, then in the evening, then Srila Bharati Maharaj comes and gives class. Then after class, they sing the last verse of Shikshastakam along with uh, Maharaj reads the last part of night of Radha and Krishna's pastimes. So uh, this Bhajan Rahasi is very significant in our uh, life as aspiring Gaudiya Vaishnavas for understanding the Rahasya or secrets of how to enter Bhajan. I once asked Srila Gurudev, you mentioned bhajan so much and we also repeat and mention bhajan. What is actually the meaning of bhajan? So Gurudev said that anything that you see or hear reminds you only and always of Krishna and Krishna's pastimes. There's no other thought in the mind. And so when singing, those thoughts naturally blossom. Speaking of blossom, the uh, third phrase in the first verse of Shikshastakam, Sreya Koyra Vachandra Kavataranam, corresponds with this fourth stage of bhakti and fourth verse of Shikshastakam. Oh Lord, I don't want any wealth, and so on. So Shreya Koitava. Shreya means uh, benedictory, all auspicious. 
there's two kinds of happiness. One is called prayas and one is called shreyas. Prayas means temporary false happiness, like an ignorant baby. It sees something shiny, dazzling, and doesn't realize that that dazzling thing, which is an open safety pin, when he bites on it, it's going to cut his tongue and cut his gums and make him bleed and cry. That's prayas, temporary false happiness, sense gratification. And then shreyas is uh, real ultimate happiness. And the devotee only, he doesn't go for the temporary false happiness, but he waits and only selects those things, those activities, those words, those associations that will give him that shreya. So shreya koira chandra kala The uh, moonbeams of the auspiciousness in the form of a white water lotus manifest in his heart. So auspiciousness comes. Auspiciousness means he's losing his bad qualities, his material desires, and his good qualities are coming. The good qualities of the devotee. What are the good qualities of the devotee? Huh? Humble. He has no other desire but to please Krishna. Compassion. Compassion due to freedom from envy is one of these four qualities in this fourth chapter. Purity of heart due to freedom from false ego is another one. What's another one? Um, no desire for retaliation. Respect for all without desiring any respect from anybody else. Okay. So let's see what verses Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has chosen. And all these good qualities come and all the bad qualities go by one thing, or two things, Harinam and Shuddha Hari Kata from Shrestha Bhaktas. The devotee at that time only accepts as much wealth and as much paraphernalia as it takes to maintain his body. When one is engaged in Vaidhi Bhakti, Srila Gurudev explains in his commentary here, then one should not only accept no more than he requires, but he should also not accept less than he requires. For a devotee situated in Raghunuga Bhakti, the path of spontaneous devotion, which doesn't depend on the rules and regulation of Shastra, which comes with a sincere, uh, uncontrolled greed to follow in the footsteps of the uh, inhabitants of Vrindavan, who are oceans of the mood for which he aspires. In Raghunuga Bhakti, there's, the requirements become less and less, <coughs> so that Raghunath Das Goswami happily subsisted on a slice of butter every other day, or a very small leaf cup of buttermilk every other day, or a couple of chickpeas every day or every few days. Why? Because they were enjoying the opulence of that realm. Because the Siddhadeya, the spiritual form of the devotee, beginning in Ashakti and manifesting further in the heart at the stage above, the devotee is tasting what's going on in that realm. That's why he has no taste here. Like Raghunath Das Goswami, he was in his Siddhadeya in his heart, 
he was meditating that he was enjoying the remnants of Radharani's feast. Sweet rice. And on his body, external body, he had he got a stomach ache. And they called the doctor, and the doctor said he overate. And everybody thought the doctor was mad because he already eats anything. The doctor said, no, he definitely overate. And then they asked him, and he said, yes, I was enjoying the sweet rice of Radharani. But does it mean that if you are perfect, you eat I'm that? sorry? Does this mean that when you're perfect, you can eat there and you don't know, you no longer have to worry for here? You don't have to worry for here, like Raghunath Goswami. I mean, he ate something, but not very much. Or um, Bhansi Das Babaji, he, um, he would be unconscious for days, so he wouldn't eat anything. Unconscious means in that realm of unconsciousness. So he just wouldn't eat for days. Is that okay? Yeah. When they are serving there... I'm wondering they, what's on your mind. Oh, when any Siddha Bhakta is serving there... Can you speak all, louder? When any Siddha Bhakta perfected living entity who is absorbed in 24 hours by the we have heard, they're always serving there in the transcendental world. And sometimes the symptoms come in the physical body that we perceive here, like the Dragona does go swami, stop there, <coughs> due to overeating. <laughs> so it seems like the real life is going on there. And sometimes they come here and they perform activities also in their sala. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. We'll come to it. But just to briefly introduce now, in that stage of mature Raghunuga Bhakti, which this fourth chapter is bringing us to, because it's the next chapter, um, I forgot to say, there's three stages. One is called Antardasa, where the devotee is fully forgetful of his external form, which is also spiritualized due to being surcharged with the spiritual energy of service and absorption. But it's his external sadhak body. And his, he's fully absorbed in his internal services as Rati Manjari. Then that breaks after some time. And he's feeling separation for those pastimes that he was participating in. And he's not fully conscious of his external body. He may be rolling on the banks of Radhakund and weeping, neither here nor there. And then, that's called Antar Bahir Dasha. Then he comes to outer sense, Bahir Dasha. And that's where he can function, he can write, excuse me, he can speak, he can dance in Kirtan, but he's still internally feeling that separation. So that comes, that's the goal of these practices. And one whose <coughs> aim and objective of all of his practices, including honoring prasadam, is to attain that stage of bhava bhakti, in mature revenue bhakti. That devotee is really called the sadak. Until that time, he's called sadak abhas, or semblance or shadow of a sadhak. So he knows this devotee who's practicing now this fourth verse of Shikshastakam. I don't want any wealth, I don't want any heaven, I don't want any um, paraphernalia of enjoyment, I don't want salvation. I can take my birth anywhere, I don't mind but I want devotion to you ever increasing at every moment. He knows his shraddha, which, which began in a small stage, at the stage of shraddha. What is the definition of shraddha? The conviction, the confidence, that if I simply engage in service to Krishna, Radha and Krishna, to Guru, 
that all other subsidiary activities are taken care of, just as by watering the root of the tree, all the leaves and branches are watered, by serving the Lord, all the demigods are served, and um, just by putting the food in the mouth that goes in the stomach, all the organs, all the other organs are nourished. So that conviction becomes intensified in this stage of ruchi, or taste. And that's why in text 3, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur quotes that verse, Yata taro mulani sechanena, which means just that, by watering the root of the tree. Then, wherever Srila um, Gurudev goes around the world, he often quotes these verses. He has uh, Shripad Bhai Manava Maharaj stand up and quote various verses from the first canto Srimad Bhagavatam. One is Tasmare Kena Manasa Bhagavan Satvatam Katihi Shrota Vyakirtita Vyascha Dyeya Pujasya Nityada with an attentive mind, one should constantly hear about, glorify, meditate upon, and worship Bhagavan, who is loving towards his devotees, Bhakti Vatsala, Bhakti Vatsala. All the while, one should endeavor to remove his anartas. What's an example of endeavoring to remove his anartas? Automatically, by engaging in Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam in the limbs of Bhakti as it's stated here, always glorifying, always hearing, always remembering and meditating on. So automatically an artist go away. So how does one endeavor to remove an artist? What's an example? One an artist, say for example, is uh, offenses, like criticizing. So I would endeavor, um, I have a choice. I can criticize or I cannot criticize. So I make the endeavor not to. That's also a chasta or a bhakti endeavor to not do something. Did you want to say something? No, I, was, I thought it was a question, so I was going to... Yeah, it's a question. <laughs> so, yeah, serving the Vaishnava, I was going to say. That's not an anartha. No, no, but it would prevent you to, to create an anartha. Instead of criticizing, I'll serve. Um, what about somebody who I don't want to serve because they're against my Gurudev? Then you wish them well. I wish them well. <laughs> and if they come to my home or temple, I will serve them prasada. But I won't engage, Srila Bharati Maharaj explained this, that for someone who's uh, in the dress of a Vaishnava, but not with the behavior of a Vaishnava, then I'll serve him, prashadam, but I won't engage in the six loving exchanges that I'll engage with, the intimate six loving exchanges, sharing my mind, hearing his mind, um, offering prashadam, yes, um, and then was giving gifts. I can give a gift in charity, but I won't engage in those activities that I'll engage with, uh, with serious devotees and especially pure devotees. Uh, the other day, Srila Bharti Maharaj was mentioning Vaishnava Seva. So I said, what do you mean by Vaishnava Seva? Do you mean Shrestha Vaishnava Seva? Or Seva of any kind of Vaishnava? And so first, he quoted Shmit, Smriti Shastra, which just talks about the Karma Kanda. If you serve a pious person, you go to heaven. If you serve a sinful person, you go to hell. But then he talks about serving the various kinds of Vaishnavas in Vaishnava Dharma. According to the level of Vaishnava you serve, that's the kind of result that you get. So sometimes service is also to... Louder. 
character, if we study the character of a Madhyam Vaishnava, then one service or activity, responsibility he has is to respect those who are envious from a distance. What do you mean? And what is envious uh, respect from a distance? It means I don't think about them. It doesn't mean that I fall down and offer my satsang dandavat pranam from across the street. What it means is I don't think about them. If I think about them, I'm going to start criticizing. So I don't think at all. Um, I asked Madhav Maharaj once, back in the 90s, um, how do you avoid, like what prayers are there to avoid criticism of those who are offensive to Sri Guru? And he immediately quoted the verses from Manashiksha, O oh mind, um, what is the, if you want to engage, if you want to engage always on the platform of Rag in uh, Goloka Vrindavan, then always engage in uh, remembering the Vaishnavas like Rupa Goswami and uh, Sri Sarup Damodar Goswami. And the other instructions to the mind, don't engage in Prajalpa, um, always think of the son of Nanda as the son of Sachi. Don't ha give up your attachment for um, hearing words of impersonal liberation. So engaging the mind and the words in all these prayers of all these books like Bhajan Rahasya, Manashiksha, and so on. And simultaneously, the chaste or the endeavor, I won't do this. What are, what are some other anarthas that I endeavor not to do? Lust. Huh? Lust. Yeah, I won't engage in lust. That's more of a sin than an offense. But it's also an anartha, meaning those uh, activities and thoughts that act as impediments. So I won't act on my lust and I'll immediately pray, Oh uh, mind, how can, um, what is it about lust? Which verse is about lust in the Manashiksha? That's a prostitute of mundane talk and the prostitute of um, the desire for fame. Yes, thank you. That's verse number five, which is what? Oh, mind, the enemies of lust, anger, greed, pride, illusion, and envy are just like a band of dacoits that assail one on the open road of material existence. They, are, they have bound me around the neck with licentious uh, deeds and desires and are thus killing me. So, oh mind, call out to the devotees who are the leaders on the path of bhakti and they will save you from these dacoits. Like that. It's good. Very good. And I won't go. Suppose there's a beautiful girl. I'll walk the other way. I won't walk that way. That way I can engage my senses in physically um, making the endeavor to avoid that anarta. Yes? So if there's a question how to avoid an arthas. There's uh, four types under Hridaya Goyam, weakness of heart, for example, being attached to insignificant objects, uh, envious about others' property, uh, pratishta, and what was the fourth? Hypocrisy, duplicity. Hypocrisy, duplicity. What about it? Uh, so if you're asking uh, what kind of an artist to get... Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Okay. So there's another um, verse that Srila Gurudev often quoted, 
which Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, mentions in text 10 of this chapter. How? Uh, these things means uh, means desire for prestige, envy of others' uh, situation. Uh, again, there's one is recognizing it and then taking action on it by offering prayers, by refusing to think it. Well, here's two kinds of thinking. One is cultivating the thought. Oh, I wish that person wasn't in that happy condition. They're getting all the glory, and nobody's glorifying me. That's one of the four features of what you mentioned, weakness of heart. So then I recognize that. Whoops, that's a weakness of heart. That's an anartha. That's going to kill my bhakti. So I'm not going to think like that. How will I think? That, uh, how will I think? There's so many ways to think. If Krishna gave me the glory, I would be puffed up. Krishna is purposely not giving the glory because he wants me to become humble. Just like I personally become very happy in the association of Srila Bharti Maharaj because he always, he'll never let me think that I'm a senior devotee. If, if there are many people uh, holding out their hands for prasadam, he'll give me last. I asked a certain question in class, and he announced to the whole class how proud I am for asking that question. And for giving classes when I don't even understand Bhagavad Gita. And then he said, just see the pride. So, so I can develop my thoughts in such a way that I take the loss and get my <coughs> Krishna's mercy. And I can offer so many prayers. I can chant thinking of all these things. Does that answer, or would you like to add something? Loud. Bhakti Hrata Kuru is telling, until we are attached, that means with transcendental affection, to the pure Vaishnava, only then our material impediments will disappear. Thank you very much. And actually, I'm very glad you said that. Because that's the whole, huh? He said, until we're attached. Transcendentally. <laughs> transcendentally attached to the pure devotees and then ultimately to Krishna. We can't give up our bad habits and thoughts. Exactly what this whole chapter is about. And this that's exactly what the verse is that I'm just about to read. So, so what Rabbi does it mean Nassim. to be attached to the, the in what way? Because I think that's also Only wanting to serve them. Means transcendental attachment means to serve in your transcendental identity, the transcendental form of Sri Guru Parapadma and your Vaishnava. Which means again coming to the stage of Asakti. <coughs> so that means and then Bhav. That means Paradar does not go. Not fully. There's even a scent of it in Bhav, although it sleeps, it doesn't wake up. And then there's the absolute freedom from an artist and frames, like that. So, until we reach Baba Bhakti, we really can't be happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can be happy, but... To Again, it's relative. Yeah, to degrees. It becomes, it becomes, and now that we the now, it becomes more and more blissful. Right. I've got a question. Uh, yesterday I read also uh, that you can serve either the Mahab Bhagavad or the Bhagavad book. The, yes. So if you don't have any association, the book will be as good as the Bhagavad. Thank you for mentioning that. Because Gurudev explains that we should always want to associate and endeavor to associate with pure devotees. In the absence of that, then the way that I read the book is, and I feel like I'm ramming it, just repeating it all the time. Oh Prabhu, you are not a book. You are Srila Bhakti Thakur yourself. You are Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all your associates yourself, whoever the book is about. You are Radha and Krishna and your associates, yourselves. You are Gurudev yourself because you gave us the commentary. 
please all of you shower your mercy upon us. And us means we're in this group now. Otherwise, if I'm reading alone, then please shower your mercy upon me. I am sitting directly at your feet, hearing directly your words that you're speaking. Again, it's not a book. And we also do this with videos and sound files. So please uh, make me realize what I'm hearing from you. Let me enter into the deepest depths of what I'm hearing. And please take away all my doubts. Srila Gurudev said, if you read in this way, then you'll be free from all doubts of Siddhanta. And if you don't read in this way, you'll be full of all doubts in Siddhanta. He said, so many hundreds of Vidvans, big scholars in Mathura, they come to me to solve their doubts. Why? Because I read in this way by these prayers. So this verse, Bhakti pare sanubhavo viraktir anyatra chai sa trika e kakala pravadyamanasya tachnataksyus tushti pushti chuda payonakasam So, this is confirming what uh, Brajanath Prabhu just said. With each morsel of food that a hungry person eats, he simultaneously experiences satisfaction, nourishment, and relief from hunger. Similarly, a surrendered devotee who is engaged in the performance of bhakti, simultaneously realizes his worshipful deity, that is, it becomes a reality. He strengthens his relationship with that deity, and simultaneously he becomes detached from the temporary world and material attachments. So automatically as one develops, there's another verse that Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur quotes from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is that all good qualities, all the good qualities of the demigods automatically manifest in the uh, pure devotee. Knowledge, renunciation, compassion, Everything, all good qualities develop. Whereas, in a, a person who has, is not a pure devotee, he can have no good qualities because he's always riding on the mental plane. Again, another verse. Srila Bhakti Manal Thakur quotes uh, text number 14. He's quoting Uda in the third canto. O Lord, it is not difficult for one who has taken shelter of your lotus feet to achieve the four goals of life. What are the goals of life? Religiosity. Religiosity means I'm very peaceful in my life due to my practicing religious principles. And economic development. Sense gratification, the joys of sense gratification, and liberation, the joy of freedom from all the sufferings of this world. A pure devotee automatically tastes these four as a natural byproduct, but he has no interest in them. Srila Gurudev would sometimes say that. Um, Lakshmi is always coming to me. How can I serve you, the goddess of wealth? Not now. You can stay at a distance. Or all these four, or moksha, salvation, comes to the devotee with folded palms. How can I serve you? But the devotee has no interest. Why? Because his interest in 
interested in Pancham Purushartha, the fifth gain, which is Krishna Prem. He's only interested in Krishna Prem, and therefore the other things are automatically following him, though he has no interest. Then, Brajanath Prabhu will remember this, and so will Rindadini. Uh, when Srila Gurudev wanted to give his special mercy day after day to his traveling associates. So after his morning walk, he would sit with them and make them <coughs> memorize verses. And the next day he would test them on it. And one of the main verses that he would test them on, Vrinda, can you say this verse, Nanaka Prestam? Virtue Sura. Nanaka Prestam, Nacha Sarva Bhumam, Rasadi Patyam, Nasa Sarva Bhumam, Nayoga Siddhira Punam Bhavamba. Louder. Samanja Sattva Vidahavya Kanshi. Meaning what? Which one is it? It's uh, six, six canto, eleventh verse. And in the book? Six oh, in the book it's eighteen. Mm -hmm. Loud. You're a big preacher. I know that, so please speak loud. He has so Sh many people that he brought to Srila Gurudev. So many people come to his temple. And yet, and his temple is not an easy temple to get to. You have to either take a helicopter there, because it's so far up in the mountains of Switzerland, or you have to walk for two hours. And still so many people come. No, so you have to climb a huh? You have to climb a mountain first. Yeah. So, so Shri Sura is saying at the very, on his deathbed, this, these last verses, he's saying, Oh my dear Lord, I don't want anything of this world. I don't want dominion over all the planets. I don't want to be any king. I don't want any liberation. I don't want <coughs> um, any yoga siddhis. I don't want really anything. But if I would have to give up the association of devotees for that. I don't want them if it means that I have to give up the association. Birth after birth, I want the association of your devotees. Thank you. So that verse corresponds with Nadanam Nadjanam. So now let's go to the end of this chapter. Because as you know, corresponding with the, one of the eight <coughs> pairs of names, corresponding with one of the stages of bhakti, corresponding with one of the Shikshastakam prayers, corresponding with one of the um, phrases in the first verse of Shikshastakam is the eightfold pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So at this time of the day, Shilabhakti Vinod Thakur is quoting from Srila Krishna Das Kavaraj Goswami's Govinda Lilamrita. It, Govinda Lilamrita is what Gurudev calls an outline of the whole day of Radha and Krishna. Radha's cooking and Krishna's honoring at prasadam. So many things from beginning of the day to the end of the day, from when they wake up to when they take rest and then wake up again. <coughs> so at the beginning of each chapter of Govinda Lilamrita, Krishna Das Kavaraj Goswami gives a summary of that chapter. And Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur quotes the summary verse at the end of each chapter of his Bhajan Rahasya. So I meditate on Sri Radha and Krishna, who at midday enjoy each other's company while being beautifully decorated with various bobs such as Astasatvik Bobs. What are the Astasatvik Bobs? What are some of the hair Astas? Standing uh, hair standing on end. Huh? Voice choked. Voice choked. Hmm? Changing of color. Changing of color. 
trembling, hair standing on end. Expansion of the bones. Expansion of the bones. That's not. Uh, no, that's not why they asked the sake. Tears. <laughs> Tears. Yes. Sweating. And then they're also. Sweating. Huh? Sweating. Sweating. Come up. Yeah. So then, so various bhavas such as the astasattvic bhavas and vyavachari bhavas. What are some of the vyavachari bhavas? Like contrariness, or like yearning. Even the gopis are envious. That's one of the vyavachari bhavas, envious of Krishna's fruit. In their amorous play, the joking words of Sri Lalita and other sakis give them much pleasure. They blissfully enjoy sports like swinging, all kinds of swinging pastimes. Sometimes Radha and Krishna swing alone. Sometimes <coughs> the swings have, they're like eight swings representing eight petals of a lotus and all the eight sakis swing with Krishna. Sometimes the sakis swing Radha and Krishna. Sometimes they frolic in the forest. Sometimes they play in the water, splashing. Sometimes stealing Krishna's flute. Like when Krishna pretends to be asleep, just so that the gopis will steal his flute. And it's really very funny because the gopis are trying to figure out who's the best one to steal his flute. So they pick Radharani because she's the most clever, but meanwhile, Krishna had planned it all like that, and she thinks she's being really clever. As she's very quietly, like a cat, you know, like a cat goes very quietly. You can't even hear a cat on the rustling leaves. So she's stealing his food, and he makes sure that, you know, his grip is really loose, so she can easily take it. And what's his idea? That after she takes the food, and he, he, Krishna knows she's going to pass it around to the different devotees, different sakis. And that way he's going to be able to touch them and see, who has my flute? Do you have my flute? Try to grab his flute. And that way he's going to be able to joke with them. Because Radharani was in Man. And Krishna knows this is a great way to get rid of her anger and uh, enjoy with her. So drinking honey. Drinking wine, is that a good thing to do for spiritualists like Radha and Krishna, getting, getting intoxicated by honey wine? Is that a good thing to do? Can anybody answer? Fortunately, I asked Guru that. And he said they're not actually intoxicated on the honey wine. They're intoxicated by their praying, and the honey wine is just an excuse. <laughs> you know, like Radharani stutters, the sky is before fall falling. <laughs> Pretending that it's that, but it's really just faltering voice from praying. There's no alcohol in the wine. Huh? There's no alcohol in the wine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so amorous meeting, drinking honey, worshipping the sun god. Any excuse for meeting? When Krishna disguises himself as a priest, and then lo and behold, um, Radharani's mother-in-law is the one who finds Krishna and Madhu Mangal, who are disguised as priests, and invites them to help Radharani to worship the sun god. And then Radharani's mother-in-law is so impressed by their good behavior. He said, she said, so you're a Brahmin, can you look at my daughter-in-law's hand and tell me something about her fortune? He said, she can show it to me from a distance. I never get near a girl's hand. And then Chitula thought, what wonderful qualities. <laughs> huh? And then uh, Krishna said when he looked at her hand from afar, oh, she's the goddess of fortune herself. And. Um, She'll always be surrounded by wealth. And Jatila wanted to give Krishna something. And Krishna said, I never take any, any gifts. 
from householders. I'm a renounced brahmachari. So Madam Mangal said, I'll take it. I'll take the sweet and I'll take the ring. <laughs> Of course, later on, all the boys snatched the sweet and made Madam Michael cry. And then he said, I'll curse you all. I'm a Brahmana. With my Brahmin's thread, I'll curse you all. So in other kinds of pastimes, while being served by their dear ones. So then Srila Gurudev's commentary on that. After finishing her prashad seva, that means she cooked breakfast for Krishna in the morning, and then Mother Yusoda insists that she and her sakis also take some remnants. And Krishna also personally saved some of his personal remnants from his lotus mouth through the hand of Dhanistha, who always sneaks Radharani or one of the manjaris, Krishna's personal prasadam. So then Radharani returns to Yavit with her sakis and eagerly awaits the meeting with Krishna. And her mother orders her to go worship the sun god. And on that pretext, she departs for Radha Kund, where she's very freely able to meet with him. And then Gurudev repeats, uh, he mentions one other pastime that's not mentioned in the text. They also play dice. Usually Radharani wins. The only time that Krishna will win in the dice is when he cheats. Because Radharani told Krishna that you can defeat us in, um, what do you call those kind of sports? Um, uh, macho muscle type? Like, uh, no, not even wrestling. Water sports, uh, throwing, splashing. Maybe you can defeat us in splashing, but in games that require cleverness, you can't win it all, unless Krishna uh, cheats. So they, for their game, for the dice game, they have, um, like what are we gonna put up as a, uh, as a stake? So <coughs> sometimes they put up um, Krishna's flute, to um, Radha's deer. Um, and then Krishna Narada says, hey, wait, where is my flute anyway? Why did you stole my flute? So then the gopis would say, well, what's the flute? It's just a piece of bamboo. There's so many bamboo rods in the forest. We'll get you another bamboo. So then sometimes the stakes are kisses. If I win, then you have to kiss me. If you win, then I have to kiss you. So Radharani said, OK, that's a good stake. So she called her friend named Bringy, Bringy? Bringy who is one of the uh, uh, Kalimba Pulinda girls. Who's, um, they're also beautiful, but not like the gopis. And they, um, they're the ones who get the firewood and do other menial services. So one of the sakis immediately goes to get Bringy, um, who sits there very shyly and embarrassed. And Krishna is also embarrassed. So Radharani said, OK, she will take the, do my stake. So in this way, they play. So then Gurudev ends the, uh, his last sentence is that, Absorbed in meditating on these pastimes, the Raghunuga Sadhan performs kirtan of Krishna's names. As we discussed in the beginning and mentioned every day in our first series of classes, I forgot to re-mention it yesterday, there's two kinds of sadhaks who are performing uh, the kirtan of the holy names. One is called the Ajata Rati Sadak, and the other kind is called the Jata Rati Sadak. Jata means that he's attained. So the Ajata Rati means he has not yet attained the stage of Bhav. And he's gradually going through these verses and realizing the different stages from Shraddha, Anartanivriti, Sadhusanga. Uh, Nista, Ruchi, and then Asakti. 
So he's gradually coming to these different stages. And he's gradually becoming free from anarthas and developing auspiciousness, auspicious qualities. And offering different prayers according to the different chapters. When the a jata rati sadak gradually now he's going to be coming to asakti in which he tastes a semblance of the ecstatic symptoms of Bhav because a semblance of his spiritual form is now manifesting in his heart. Then when he attains Bhav, then he becomes one with the Jata Rati Sadak. So that while the Ajata Rati Sadak is going through these different stages, as every time the Jata Rati Sadak says, is chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and uttering the various pairs of the mantra, the names Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. He's meditating always on the eightfold daily pastimes of the Lord. And at the same time, he's experiencing his own form engaged in that service. And then he comes in and out of it, in internal and external um, consciousness. So this stage, now we're coming to this fifth chapter of Bhajan Rahasya. So text one, remember, is always the verse of Shikshastakam that corresponds with the particular stage of bhakti. So this fifth chapter corresponds with the stage of asakti, natural attraction, attachment, like a boy for a girl, or vice versa. And it corresponds with the fifth verse of Shikshastikam, and it corresponds with the fourth phrase. Let's all go to our Wheel of Fortune. This is when fortune begins to rise in the heart of the conditioned soul who's coming in contact. Eikupe Brahmanda Bhomite Konya Bhagyavanaji Guru Krishna Prashade Pai Bhakti Latabij the living entity is wandering through the various species of life, 8,400,000 to be exact. And here and there he's performing spiritual pious activities called sukritis, which gives him sun scars or impressions on the heart. After millions of such births, he comes to real connection with a genuine sadhu and uh, develop shraddha or faith in Krishna Bhakti and in the Holy Name. And then he gradually comes to an Arjuna Bhakti and Bhajana, uh, what is it? Um, Bhajana Kriya, engaging in the uh, limbs of Bhakti and then coming through the different stages. So now, looking at this wheel of fortune, now we're coming to Asati. And this is the fourth phrase of the first verse of Shikshastika, which begins how? No, no, uh, how do you start the, the uh, no, no, how do you start the Shikshastika verse? No, the whole, the first verse. Chaito Darpana Marjanam Bhava Mahadava Nirvapanam Shreya Kaila Vacham so now we're Vidya Vajuni, Vidya Vadu Jivanam. The chanting is the life of all transcendental knowledge, which is compared with a wife. And that is compared with this fifth verse, which is now Ainanda Tanaja Kinkara Patitama Vishimidavam Buddha. Kripayata 
Oh Nanda Nanda, O oh, son of Nanda Maharaj, <coughs> as a result of my food of activities, I have fallen to this fearful ocean of material existence. Please bestow your mercy upon me, upon this eternal service, servant of yours. Consider me to be just like a speck of dust at your lotus feet, and always accept me as your purchase service. Uh, when somebody purchases a, an animal or a servant, then that servant has no thought for its maintenance or what it's going to do. It's just under that master. Now this is the chapter. We'll discuss it more tomorrow. This is the chapter where Gurudev would always call on Sri Pai Pai Manabhamaraj to, to uh, recite and explain these three verses from the Bhagavatam, chapter 2. Can you remember Srinivas Bhagavata Krishna? Yeah, which is about the importance of hearing and chanting and good association. And then the result is that the modes of passion and, and ignorance disappear from the heart and one becomes situated in the mode of pure goodness. We'll discuss more about that later. But uh, later means in two days. Tomorrow I have no class. Somebody who's giving class tomorrow at this time? Prakashat Mahaprabhu. Prakashat He's leaving in the evening. Okay. Okay, and then we'll do our this class Thursday. Okay. So, in this chapter, it's so amazing because we're coming in this chapter. This is like a, what do you call it? In, like, in the movies? Huh? Uh, when you see previews of what's to come? Commercial, right? Co coming attractions. So, um, we'll be hearing lots of prayers of the gopis and lots of prayers of Raghunas Raghunath Das Goswami for service of Srimati Radhika. And also the different kinds of um, <coughs> verses of the devotee, of the gopis in different kinds of moods, in the mood of unsubmissiveness, in the mood of submissiveness. Um, as we come to uh, when Krishna meets the gopis in the 10th canto of, of Srimad Bhagavatam. So very interesting things to come. And now we'll ask if there's any questions or comments. Please keep your prayers with you and your will of fortune. And uh, in two days we'll be uh, using them again. So the homework assignment is study the will of fortune. Uh, memorize the Shikshastakam prayers. Thank you. If you haven't already done so. And uh, required reading since there's no paper paper-bound books of Bhajan Rahasya is if you can, uh, if you don't already have it, if you can purchase Shikshastakam from the um, from the temple here. Because Shikshastakam is all about Shikshastakam. So any questions or comments, additions, subtractions, ifs, ands, or buts? Yes, Damodar Prabhu. Loud. Is the Shikshastakam prayer in the six verses, six verses which we've been singing every day of the Shikshastakam prayers are there. Seven and eight we don't have, so we're going to have to... It's in this, seven and eight? In the whole, the actual in the song book? Shikshastakam itself. Oh, the sh thank you. The Shikshastakam prayers themselves are there in the section called Shikshastakam. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur's songs that expand on the Shikshastika verses, thank you for the clarification, just go up to six, so we'll get Xerox copies of seven and eight so that we can sing them. At a quarter to the hour is when we sing Bhakti Vinod Thakur's expansion of the Shikshastika verses. So all the Shikshastika verses are in our songbook, but the elaborate commentaries on them of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Gurudev um, are given in that book, Shikshastakam, Jiva Goswami's commentary. Very, very interesting. 
So, any questions or comments? Yes. So, at what stage does Bhajan Abbas actually become real? In Bhav. Coming to that in Asakti. In Asakti, there's real tears. Gurudev said, until Asakti, tears are crocodile tears. One moment, oh, I can't believe this tune just put me in ecstasy. And the next moment, I'm angry at somebody because they didn't do what I wanted them to do. But in Asakti, the tears are real from the heart because the Siddhadeya is starting to manifest in the heart. So yeah, Vajra becomes real then. We're now coming to it in two days. Huh? Asakti, yeah. We are coming. We are coming. Oh. At least Brenda's coming to it. <laughs> Any other? Okay. No questions, and coincidentally, it's 12.15. Now we're ending, and now there's getting ready for RT, and then we have more prasada. Kaur Premanandi Hari Hari. Shila Bhakti Vinod Thakur Ki Jai, Shila Jan Rahasi Ki Jai, Shila Gurudev Ki Jai, Shila Premanandi Hari Hari. Just it. Oh, your time. You want to do a three-minute take